29 and verse 11. Let's stand for the reading of the word of God. We stand for kings and presidents. It's not a bad thing to stand for the living word. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. And this is Jeremiah speaking on behalf of God. So it's, it's a prophetic pronouncement. Verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. That's it. So what he's saying is that God's thoughts that he thinks towards us, saith the Lord, are thoughts of good. King James renders it as peace. Other versions render it as good and not evil. So he seeks to do you no evil. He's not the author of evil saith the Lord, and to give you an expected end. What's the expectation? Good. A good future. Help me turn to a neighbor and tell the neighbor, I have a great future. Watch out for me. <laughs> Psalm 78 and verse 40 to 42. I will read in your hearing. How often did they provoke him in the sojourn, the wilderness, and grieved him in the desert? Yes, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Verse 42, they remembered not his hand, nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. Particular emphasis, the 41st verse. They provoked God by unbelief in their journey towards the promised land that flowed with milk and honey. And verse 41 says, they turned back and tested or tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. I'm particularly looking at the term limited the Holy One of Israel. Will you slap four or five people a high five and tell them, do not limit God. Don't limit God. It's a temptation that we often fall into to place limitations upon what God can do, what God has determined to do, what God purposes to do, but requires your faith as collaboration with him to deliver on his plan, his thoughts, his purpose for your life. And I absolutely believe that there is a great possibility that you might be limiting God from doing much more than he's doing amidst you, in you, and through you. I believe you can go further. I believe you can have more. I believe you can do more. I believe you can own more. I believe you can be much more useful to God than you and I presently are. Will you bow your head to me in a word of prayer and let's pray together. Our Father, we honor the power of your presence and the power of the preached word. Your word says that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We ask that you supply the spirit and the unction to bring forth the oracles of God in a transformational way that every person under the sound of the voice of teaching and preaching this morning will leave transformed, will leave whole and sound, healed, will leave with a, a major realignment of their focus, their faith, with your thoughts and plans for their expected end. If what we expect it's not in alignment with what you expect. Fix us this morning and do your pleasure. We secure the salvation of a sinner. We declare healing to the body of somebody who is broken or hurting. We declare that destiny is secured. Most of all, the heavens are open for heaven to have her way in the midst of the gathering of your people. We thank you ahead of time for what you are about to do. We praise you now. You can do it whenever you want to. We declare it to be so in Jesus' name. And everybody who believes, please shout a very big amen. amen. The chances are, my friends, that you and I are limiting God from all that he wants to do in and through our lives. And help me to preach to one person this morning and tell him 
you can go much further than where you are right now. God wants you to receive much more than you presently are receiving from him by the way of his acts, his goodness, his deeds, and his dealings in your life. I'm bold to say this because he is the limitless God. He has no limits. One preacher tried to look for the day he was born, and as far as he could search into eternity past, he could not find the day of the birth of God. And he looked as far into the future as the future was flung in his imagination and could not find the day that God died. He could find no obsequies, could find no funeral arrangements. And he simply concluded, thou art from everlasting to everlasting. Simply put, he is inexhaustible. He is limitless. He is indefinable. You cannot put an end to who he is. I can get tired of being a blessing to a person or to somebody, but God never runs out of anything. He never runs out of life, never runs out of goodness, never runs out of his riches, never runs out of his blessing because he is inexhaustible. He is infinite. He is everlasting. He is bigger than everything. He's bigger than your denomination. He's bigger than your dogma. He's bigger than your theology. He's bigger than your belief system. He's bigger than your Bible. He's bigger than anything you can imagine in your mind. He is exceedingly abundantly far above all you can ask or think or imagine and is able to do much more than you can think. So he gave you a powerful mind, not so that he could frustrate you, but so that he could show you that if you can think it, I can outdo it. He cannot run out of anything. And that's why you and I must not limit him nor attempt to put him in a box. Because your God is absolutely limitless. And by the way, he's not only limitless in heaven. He's limitless even though he is carried in the person of who you are. God can never run out of anything. If I bless you this morning and give you something today, something physical, something material, and you come back a few days later and I give you some more again and you keep coming back, after a while I'm going to shrink or, or shirk from you because I will get tired of, of continuity in giving and giving and giving. But God can never get tired of giving. He's like a woman whose mammary glands are engorged with milk from her mammary glands to give to her baby, to her nursing suckling. Um, and she needs to give it more than the baby needs to receive it because if the baby doesn't receive it, her mammary glands become engorged and painful. God has so much and he never runs out and there's much more where it came from. In fact, he is bigger than any number that mankind can crunch in all the computers that mankind has. You cannot divide him because no matter how big a number is that you can find and you divide his number by that number, you will still get the number infinity, which is not definable because God is absolutely big. He's bigger than biggest. He's bigger than the biggest. Like the geo will often say, he is absolutely enormous. The Israelites followed him out of captivity from Egypt and they got to a place where there was no water. The land was parched. They had run out of rivers. They had run out of springs. There were no oasis in the wilderness and they thought of stoning Moses and said, were there not enough graves for you to come and bury us out here in this wilderness? And we want to go back to Israel. We want to go back to captivity because they put limits on God. And God said, I don't run out of anything. I can become anything you need me to become whenever you need me to be it. I am what I am. Moses asked him, who will I tell them sent me? He said, tell them that I am. That means I can transform into anything I need to be to bless my people whenever I need to be it. When you're in the hot pursuit of your assailants, the Calvary of Egypt, I'll be a pillar of fire to distinguish between you and them and to separate them from you. When you're boiling in the heat of the sweltering Palestine sun, I'll be a pillar of cloud to climatize your, your day and your afternoon so that you don't burn up in the heat of the sun. When you don't have food to eat, I'll open up the windows of heaven and I'll blow with a blast of my nostrils and send you food that angels eat. When you get tired of manna, I'll blow another east wind and send you quail so that you can have something that tastes like chicken for your morning feed. Whatever you need, I'm able to be that. I can become rock out of a water. I'll bring what you're thirsty, from, thirsty for out of strange places. I'll satiate your thirst with, with places and things that you have no idea that I could make. Just because you ran over water doesn't mean I can run out of water. I can make water by blinking my eye. I can call water out of nothing. I can bring water out of deserts. I can bring water out of the wilderness. Whatever you need, I can do it. 
Just because your mama is limited and your papa is limited and your banker is limited and your money is running out or your bank account is drying up, it doesn't mean that I'm dried up. And if you stay connected to me, I can give you what I have. And baby, I have everything. I have more than enough. I have so much that even if there were a thousand planets called Earth, I'd have enough to go around and much more left over. In fact, I'll always have more left over than I give out because I am infinitum. I am everlasting. I am ex inexhaustible. I am infinite. I am absolutely, completely limitless. If you believe that, shout amen, somebody. Amen. Chances are then, my friends, that you are limiting God from releasing all that he has already provided for you to live a fulfilled and prophetic life before God. And you say, Pastor, well, how will we do that? The answer is simple. We limit God by wrong belief systems. First of all, we believe that things that we have done right or done wrong are what determine how much God will do in our lives. My friends, you don't do good to get good. Because if you do bad, you get bad. That's not necessarily true. And then if you do good, you get good. That's not necessarily true. God did you good, not because you did good, not because you are good, but because he is good. And he is good all the time, regardless of your performance. The understanding of unmerited favor is exactly that. It is not merited. Therefore, what God does in your life has nothing to do with your performance, but everything to do with who he is and what he wants to do with your life. And the only thing he requires from you is a heart that believes, a heart that has faith in who he is and believes correctly in who God is towards you. God is sovereign. However, we limit him from doing what he wants to do in our lives by how we believe wrongly about him and what we believe about ourselves. It is true that God is sovereign. Yes, that is true. But he is not in control of everything. In fact, on earth, he is not in control. I never said that he was in control of the earth. It is an insult to God to tell God that he's in control of the earth and the world when there is a Syria and ISIS and Osama bin Laden and Boko Haram because God can never be in control where that's going on. Where God is, it is bliss and perfection there. He's only in control of the kingdom of heaven above and the kingdom of heaven in our hearts, and wherever men believe correctly in him, he is there in them to the degree that they believe. In fact, in Genesis chapter 1, I believe it's verse 27, he said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness, and let them have dominion over the face of the earth. So whilst he is the sovereign, he ceded some of his sovereignty to us, to mankind. The truth then is that you are in control, where you often say, God is in control. If God was in control, there would not have been a Hurricane Harvey on, on the face of the planet. If God was in control, uh, Boko Haram would not be ravaging Nigeria the way that they are. If God was in control, there would be no ISIS and all that Syrian mayhem that's going on in the Levine region. If God was in control, there would not be sickness in your body. Because where God is in control, sickness cannot be in control, nor can it be present. Ooh. Ah, hallelujah. That means that I need to tell you something right now. There are some things that have happened in your life that you don't need to accept. That means God didn't order them, God did not ordain them, and you don't have to accept them as given by God in your life because your God is never the author of evil. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11, the Bible clearly declares, Thus saith the Lord, uh, I know the thoughts that I think concerning you. Thoughts of evil? No. Thoughts of good and not evil evil to give you an expected end he wants you to have an expectation of a future and that expectation he clearly wants must not be an evil expectation but a good expectation because he is not the author of evil and cannot be if you punch God anywhere or pinch him anywhere, the only thing you'll find coming out of him is good. He has no evil in his constitution. He is good and only good. And concerning his own children, if you as parents know how to give your children good things, how much more will your father not only give you good things? Yes, it is true that bad things happen to good people, but God was never the author. It was Satan who intended evil by the harm he did you. But God being so good, when the enemy did evil to you and intended 
intended it to ravage you and ruin you. God is well able to take what the enemy intended for evil and turn it till it works together with everything else that's happening in your life for good, for your purpose, for his plan, for your glory, for his glory, for the betterment of his kingdom so that people will look upon you and say of a truth, God is good. Please give me a witness and slap one neighbor a high five and say, neighbor, something is about to happen in your life. So look at somebody again and tell them, do not accept everything that happens in your life as God's will for you. That accident was not the will of God. That sickness is not the will of God. That premature death is not the will of God. Poverty is not the will of God for your life. Lack is not the will of God for your life. The enemy may have sent it and God knows how to use it for your good, but God was never the author of evil in your life. The Bible actually profoundly declares that he is the author and the finisher of your faith. This is important to grasp because he is not author separate from finisher. He is Alpha and Omega. That's one hyphenated name. They are not two separate names. It's one hyphenated name. He is beginning and end. One name. That means he cannot be the beginning without also being the end. He cannot be the end without being the beginning. That means if he begun anything, he has already guaranteed its finish. That means if he started anything, he already finished it before he started. That means, honey, you may go through a wilderness, you may pass through some dry times, you may go through some seasons, but if he started with you, you better get ready for your promised land. What God said is going to happen in your life is going to happen. And all he needs you to do is believe that he's not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should relent. If he said it, he'll make it good. If he spoke it, he will bring it to pass. Everything else that you're going through will pass, but the word of the Lord is forever ever settled in heaven and sooner than later it will be settled in your life it will be settled in your finance it will be settled in your body it will be settled in your family it will be settled in your career if you don't believe it say nothing but if you do shout yeah look at somebody for me and tell them do not limit God I know you had some hard times. I know you were broken in some bare places. I know you've been through hell and on your way back. Or I know you've been down in a dungeon and are trying to scratch your way back up. But I want you to know that God did not produce that evil in your life. He didn't even allow it. You allowed it. And God couldn't touch it because you are in charge. And he puts you in charge. And he requires you to know what you should allow and what you should not allow. And he's not going to bend over and mess up your dominion by taking over where he puts you in charge. Are you with me this morning? If you don't believe it, say nothing, but if you tell your neighbor you are in charge. In other words, what you allow is what's going to become allowable. What you don't allow is what is not allowed. Did he not tell us whatever you bind? In other words, whatever you disallow is disallowed. Whatever you loose is loose. Why? Because on earth you are in charge. Psalm 115 and verse 16. Psalm 115 and verse 16. The Bible says the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's. But the earth has he given to the children of men. That means the earth belongs to you. You are the gatekeeper of the earth. You determine what comes in and what goes out. That's why Elijah could control the heavens and determine whether they would, whether they would give rain or not give rain. That's why whatever happens in your life, honey, whether you realize it or not, you allowed it. And the reason why we allow what we're not supposed to allow is often predicated on our belief systems. Glory to God. The Bible tells us in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, my people suffer, my people perish. Hosea 4, 6, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. When you don't know what you have and who you are and what is your right and what God has already done from eternity, you will allow things that are not meant to be permissible in your life. Glory to God. So if you settle the issue of knowledge, You've settled what you allow and what you don't allow in your life. Hosea 4 and verse 6. My people are destroyed for what? The lack of knowledge. When you don't know what you shouldn't allow, you will allow what you ought not to allow. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. John chapter 8, verse 31. John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Discipleship is not merely um, coming to church on Sunday morning. It doesn't make you a disciple. It is continuity in the study of the word of God. That makes you a disciple by practice of the continuity of what you study in the outworking of your life. St. Paul tells us in his letter to the Hebrews, and I believe he wrote Hebrews, that anybody who uses milk is unskillful in the teaching of righteousness. So you are a baby if you don't understand the righteousness of God. And the fact that God made the church, the believer, the righteousness of God in Christ. So you could be 40 years old in the pulpit and have a massive church and still be a baby. Why? Because you could be teaching the righteousness of the law. And when people are grounded in the righteousness of the law, what it does is it prevents them or limits them from receiving everything that God has in store for them. You understand what I'm saying? Do you get it? So just because you were born again three weeks ago doesn't necessarily make you a baby. The likelihood that if you are three weeks old in in Christ, you are a baby is very high. But just because you are 40 years in the Lord doesn't make you mature either. What makes you mature is that you are skillful in your understanding of the righteousness of God by faith. St. Paul said in his letter to the church at Philippi, Doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness of God by faith. That I may know him and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness of God by faith. That means the righteousness he had was the righteousness that comes as a function of faith in the finished work. Can I detour for a few moments? When my parents procreated me, they procreated me as a male man. That needs to be said in today's America. (laughs) And I could shave off all my facial hair. Shave off my mustache, my beard, my, uh, put on eyebrow pencil, eyelashes, a weave on from Colombia or from Antifumi, <laughs> some foundation, some makeup, some of my wife's earrings, some rouge, lipstick, and then a wonder bra and one of my ni- wife's nice frocks. That'd be too tight. <laughs> and some pumps to go and fix my, my fingertips. My lips and my hips, yeah? And I would fool some people into thinking I was a woman, but the fact would still remain that I am not what I do, I am what I was made. And I still remain a male man. Now, when you were a sinner, you became a sinner not because you sinned. Sinning does not make you a sinner. It was Adam who made you a sinner. Romans chapter 5 verse 17 tells us that through one man's offense, all became sinners. However, through one man's righteous deed, many were made righteous. In fact, in Paul's letter to Corinth, second letter, he says, he says to us that God made him who knew no sin become sin for us. So did Jesus deserve to be made sin? But God gave him what he didn't deserve. Look at the rest of the verse. So that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Do we deserve to be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? Absolutely not. So he gave Jesus what Jesus didn't deserve and gave us what we didn't deserve. And so he made you the righteousness of God in Christ. The same way my parents made me a male man. Even if I go and commit sin. Sin does not make me unrighteous. Look at two people, tell them, be yourself. yourself. 
Now, when you are a believer and you are the righteousness of God, anytime you sin, you will hate the sin. Because you have a new nature. That new nature that's on the inside of you is the righteousness of God in Christ. That means, my friends, anytime God looks at you, he doesn't see you. He sees Christ. He sees righteousness. He sees divine perfection. He sees the glory and the riches of Christ covering you like a robe and imbuing you internally completely. So he doesn't judge you. Did he not tell Jacob ooh, and Israel? He said, I have perceived no iniquity in Jacob, nor have I seen any perversion in Israel. That does not mean that Jacob and Israel, born again and born again and not born again, did not have iniquity in their lives. Just meant that he could not see it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You'll get it if you understand that this is an accounting matter. Uh, I need two persons to come. Would you come, sir? Would you come? This is God, big God. This is you, sinner. Would you come, sir? <laughs> and this is Jesus. He owes God five billion dollars in transgression debt. Yeah? Jesus comes along. And he decides, I'm going to pay sinner's debt to God. I'm not going to pay $5 billion. I'm going to play, pay as inexhaustibly as I am inexhaustible. So he grossly overpaid sinner's debt to God in a way that makes God so glad with Jesus. And removes all God's anger and wrath with sinner. Because Christ has paid him much, 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 much infinitesimally more or infinitely more than the debt accrued. So that it took into account the debt accrued and the potential for debt accrual in all of the man's future in this body of sin. So as far as God is concerned, when he looks at sinner now, what does he see? He sees sinless perfection sitting at his right hand in all majesty, far above all principality and power, rulers of this age, spiritual wickedness in high places. So he finds no fault in sinner. In fact, he says sinner is now saint. And he has gifted you righteousness as a free gift. Ephesians 2 and verse 8. It's a free gift. You don't work for it. You don't labor for it. It's a free gift. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Now you need to feed yourself with this consciousness because when you walk in this consciousness, sin becomes virtually impossible. The Bible teaches us in Titus chapter 2 and verse 11 that the, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Teaching us to deny all ungodliness, unrighteousness, to live soberly before God. Grace does not teach sin. There's no way that you can be the righteousness of God in practice without understanding righteousness correctly. All the law of Moses does is it drives sin into sophistication. Drives sin into hiding. It doesn't banish it. But grace stood in the way of judgment and stood in the way of sin, took all the penalty of sin and buried sin as far as all who would believe upon Christ are concerned. You just need to become conscious of that reality. Did you not notice that once you gave your life to Christ, what you used to enjoy before, you now hate it. What you used to hate, you now enjoy. When I was a sinner, I would do the sin and then I'd call up my, my friends and say, this is what it was like, man, party with me. Oh, you'll get that next week. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. So I, I want us to just rejoice for the next 30 seconds for the fact that God has paid the full price, past, present, and future.
That means faultless you stand before his throne dressed in his righteousness alone. God cannot find fault in the life of a believer. Does it make any sense for the one who released you from the charges to be the one who now charges you with sin? What he does is he charges you with righteousness. Glory to God. Let's move it along. It is important then to know the word of God, but it is not enough to know the word. Words are no better than the thinking or the mind that produce those words. I was teaching my staff the other day, and I said to the staff, I said, I'm tired of repetitively giving you the same instructions over and over again. Because if I give you instructions, it keeps you as babes. It keeps you in a state of immaturity as it concerns the execution of the duties and the goals and targets of the ministry. I said, what I'm more interested in is, is you having my mind so that I don't have to think for you. And every time you run into a quagmire or a difficulty or a concern or a tight corner in executing the work, you have to come back to me to find out what I think. But if I can install my mind in your head, then you can think your way out of that situation the way the visionary would like to think. So I'm not so much in the business of giving people the word or my word. I'm more interested in giving them my mind. That's my staff. When it comes to preaching, I'm more interested in giving you the thinking processes of God, not just the word of God. Because the word spoken is only the product of the thinking that produced it. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, Paul caught this and shared it with the Philippian church and said, let this mind be in you. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What mind? The mind that thought it not robbery to be equal with God. In other words, he wants you to be in a state where your mentality, your psychology, your ideology is such that you see yourself on the same level as God. Where God seated Christ and God seated you inside Christ when he seated him at the right hand of the Father. So that if God is limitless, he wants you to also operate in limitlessness. To the degree that you have knowledge. The Bible says this, and I quote from Apostle John's epistle. Apostle John said to us, he said, as he is, so are we in eternity. No, as he is, so are we in this world. Selah. Look at a neighbor and tell him, neighbor, you have no idea what you are carrying. <laughs> and then look back at them and say, if you only knew who it was sitting beside you, you'd ask me for my autograph. If you knew who it was, you'd ask me to bless you. If you knew who it was seated beside you, you'd ask me to lay my hands and speak a prophetic or apostolic word upon your life. In Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, he said, we have the mind of Christ. This is critical, my friends, because if you're not thinking the way God is thinking, it becomes difficult for you to receive what God has thought about you and planned for you concerning the outcome of your own life. Yes, it is true that God is a thinker. His thinking is so profound, it's so profuse. His thinking is so powerfully great. You have God's creativity because you are a child of God. You are created in his image and in his likeness. And it begs the question, how did God create what he created? How did he create what he created? God's creation was seated in the back side of eternity for eons and eons of light years of profound thought. All he was doing was thinking. That's all he did, think. That's all he did was think. I believe in prayer. And I, I think I'm a praying man relative to most. But I've discovered that thoughtless prayer is just sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. And all God did was think. Think. He's thinking. I love thinking people. The greatest men and women on the face of our earth are people who are not Pentecostals. I don't mean to burst your bubble. Because Pentecost has generally taught Christians not to think. 
to depend on the Holy Ghost who created the brain to think. But instead we choose not to be thinkers. Oh, I feel right at home right now. I feel right at home. I'm going to talk to you like as if you are a house on the rock. And look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, think. Neighbor, think. Do you not know that the lion has the weapon of powerful jaws and a mighty roar that would paralyze its prey on appearance or the sound of its roar? The eagle has a powerful beak and a span that is so wide that he can soar to great heights that man cannot fly to. Do you not know that the, the rhino is heavy and just its weight is its weapon? Or have you considered the cheetah that can reach 60 mph at three seconds flat with just two or three bounds? And if I was targeted by any of the above, I would be helpless. But God will not leave you helpless without a weapon. Amen. I can't fight the lion with my paws, nor with my roar. I can't fight the cheetah with my flight because I can't run. I can't fight the hippopotamus with my weight because it's much heavier than I have. But I have a mind. And if you allow me to use my mind, send me the lion. I'll cock my shotgun that I made with my mind and blow the lion to pieces. Oh, I'll even learn how to fly higher than an eagle by making an Airbus 380 or a space shuttle. You hear what I'm saying? I, I can't run as fast as a cheetah, but I can make a motorcycle that's much faster. You hear what I'm saying? Because what God gave you as your weapon is the ability to think. The ability to think. And when the anointing gets a hold of an empty brain, it amounts to a mightily empty brain. If you anoint a fool, all you've got is a very anointed fool. Anointed foolishness. But if you anoint a thinker, you have put an anointing on somebody who uses his mind in a similar way to the way that God uses his mind. God wants you to think, baby. Think. If they put you in a tight corner, you have a weapon called your mind. Use it. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. You can think your way out of any corner. You can think your way out of poverty. You can think your way out of lack. You can think your way out of sickness. In fact, the Bible declares, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And if you run with the wrong people, you're going to think like wrong folk. And you'll end up in a wrong place, in a wrong destiny. You'll end up in a place that doesn't flow with milk and honey. You'll end up in a wilderness and be looking for somewhere that you can't get to because your mind normally comes out of captivity first before your life comes out of captivity. Every time my wife gave birth to a baby, none of them came out with their feet or their hips or their side. They all came out head first. You know why? Your mind will escape your snare before your body, your wealth, your finance, and your experience and career escape the snare. You think out before you get out. So when we look at the creation story, here is God. He looks at the earth that he had created in verse 1 of Genesis 1. And somewhere between verse 1 and verse 2, something cataclysmic happened to the earth that from verse 2 forward, uh, the earth is bleak, it's black, it's dark. It is without form and void and darkness is upon the face of the deep. And there was a heavy anointing on the face of the deep. You can be very anointed and yet nothing happens in your life. You hear me? Inside that earth, there was huge potential. The Bible says the earth was without form. It had no character or seeming coming comeliness. And darkness was on the face of the deep. Everywhere you see the word darkness in scripture, most in generally it refers to ignorance, the lack of knowledge. Wherever you see light in the scripture, it doesn't refer to illumination like what you see through natural light or electrical light. It refers to enlightenment, knowledge. You appreciate what I'm saying? Please stay with me, I'm going somewhere. And it appeared to be void, empty, empty of possibility, empty of resource. Empty of potential. And the anointing was still there. Brooding upon the face of the waters. Until God started speaking. Nothing happened until he started speaking. But his speaking was not arbitrary from the top of his head. His speaking was the product of his thinking. I know the thoughts. 
that I think of the earth. Thoughts of good and not evil to give the earth an expected end. And then he started speaking what he was thinking. And once he started speaking, things began to happen. First thing that happened is knowledge came. He could now see what was inside the earth. And that's what we call illumination. When God speaks, it gives a pattern for the order of increase in your life. Illumination, differentiation, separation, and then bringing forth or what we call creation. Because everything God brought forth, he commanded to come forth out of what existed in an earth cavity that didn't look like it had anything in it. By the way, that is just the metaphor for who you are. Because as he spoke to the earth, so he expects you to speak to your earth. Because inside you, there are riches according to the glories of Christ in you as there were riches inside the earth. Everything that you see today, including your building, God brought it out of the earth. The mountains, he brought them out of the earth. The bedellium, the manganese, the magnesium, the gold, the cobalt, the, the crude oil, uh, the platinum, uh, the diamonds. All of that stuff he brought out of the earth. When he wanted to create uh, the sea creatures, he commanded the waters to bring forth. And they brought forth tilapia, spotted trout, cod, uh, shark, mako shark, white shark, uh, killer whale. He, he brought forth the birds also from, from the water. And he called them to come forth and they came forth. He spoke to the trees and they came forth out of the earth. Everything he created, he created from their created source. But when it came to creating man, he did not speak to the seas or to the air or to the waters. He spoke to himself and said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness and let them have dominion on the face of the earth. And what God had brought out of the earth, he was going to now use man to bring out of what he, God, had brought out of the earth and make places like Dominion Chapel. Out of sand, out of rock, out of minerals, out of resources that came from the granite of the earth. Are you here, somebody? My point is this. You have no idea what you're carrying on the inside of you. Brings me, importantly now, to Ephesians chapter 1. And I'm going to pick it up from verse 16. And there Paul writes and says, I'm praying for you that God will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of the Son of God. Yeah? So that you would know him, number one. Then he goes on to say that the eyes of your understanding, your understanding has eyes, would be enlightened to know. This is not to think or to believe, this is to know. Knowing is the highest form of believing. Knowing is something that nobody can take from you. Something that you know in your knower about God and about yourself. That the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened to know what he was hoping for when he called you. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? So when God looked at his inheritance, surveyed it, he didn't take it to Bank of America. Nor did he take it to Merrill Lynch. He decided... I'm going to put it in you. That means you can have the riches of the glory of his inheritance in you and not even be aware you're carrying it. Bankers call it advice, where without the physical movement of cash or a physical check or money in currency that you can see with the eye, an electronic transfer takes place. And it's there. And it can be there and you never know it unless you get an alert. My job is to alert you to the fact that a transfer was made in your life when Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. And he didn't need for you to already be in time for him to do that. When he did it back then, it was already deposited in who you are even though you were not born yet. Because you existed before you were born. 
You existed in the mind of God. You existed in the thinking of God. And in that moment, he already deposited in you the riches of the glory of what he was going to inherit from you in your generation, in your time on the earth. What was he hoping for when he called you? You'll never be able to do it until you understand in your intellect uh, what are the riches of the glory of God's inheritance in you. Friend, you are carrying stuff. Whilst I was smoking crack cocaine on the back streets of Miami 36 years ago, groveling around like a derelict, a destitute on the back, in the back woods of downtown Miami, there was something already happening inside my being and my body. The rock cathedral already existed. The house on the rock was already a reality. The experience was already put inside of me, but I did not know I was carrying it. For many years, whilst he wasn't even born, uh, I was driving by where the Rock Cathedral land was and all we could see was water and I didn't even know we owned the land. Uh, I wonder what you are driving by that you don't even realize you own. I wonder what you pass by when you go to the car shop and don't even know that it's already yours. Uh, you might be sitting beside the guy that you're going to get married to and be unaware of it. You might be begging the bank manager who's holding your money and you think uh, that he's the one who owns it without you realizing that it's oh you ain't helping me this Sunday morning my job is to let you know that because of who you are and who you are carrying inside of you if he is the owner of everything then friends you are limitless in your potential in your capacity and in your possibility if it's you that I'm preaching to this morning I want you to look for two people and tell them anything is possible uh, the next Zuckerberg might be in this building is possible you might pay off your mortgage in the next two years is possible. The doctor said you'll never have a baby. You tried 10 IVFs already, but the devil is a liar. My Bible says, let every man be a liar and let God alone be true. Anything is possible. Dominion Chapel might become 10,000 members in the next three or four years. God can cause you to know in your heart of hearts what he is saying, what he is doing, and that he is limitless. And the result of that might just be that your church will multiply in leaps and bounds. And before you can say Jack Robinson, your church could be 10,000. Look at three more people, slap them a high five, and tell them, friend, anything is possible. Your own house is possible. Your own breakthrough is possible. Two or three or four more zeros added to your bank account is very possible. The next Zuckerberg may be in Dominion Chapel. The next Mandela that will fix Nigeria may be in Dominion Chapel. The next Paul of Tarsus may be in Dominion Chapel. In fact, maybe the next Nemo might be one of your children. You don't know who Neymar is? Neymar's that guy who has a pair of feet that can score goals in opponents' goal nets and earns a million pounds every two weeks. And his family, just for being his mother, father, and siblings, they got a big packet of something like 15 million pounds. You ain't hear me what I'm saying to you. If you don't believe anything is possible, please sit down, stitch your two lips together, cross your legs, and act important. But if you know, that anything is possible in your life. I want you to shout unto God with a voice of victory. And if you know how to clap, clap your hands, all ye people. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3, ch chapter 23 and verse 7. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you think it is impossible, that's how it will be for you. But if you think anything is possible with God, then friends, so be it with God. You, your next level is your reality. You're going to leap over it to a greater level than what you considered your next level. Something is about to happen in somebody's life. Don't let anybody deter you. Don't let anybody defer you. Don't let anybody detest you. My friends, God is about to do something supernatural in somebody's life. No matter what anybody says, something is about to happen in your life. You know why? There is a God factor. There is a God factor. There's a God factor. First point I want to leave you is this. Don't let your past determine your future. Don't allow your past circumstances 
to determine your future. In Isaiah 43, the prophet declared for God, remember not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? Question mark. I will make roadways in your wilderness and I will make rivers run in your desert. The things you called impossible, I will make them immediately possible, saith the Lord. Your past is not a forecast of your future. Yes, everybody has a history and you can't help where you've been, but sure enough, you can help where you're going. There is something that happens in the country Nigeria where many of us have come from, but some of you sound so American that we couldn't detect that you were Nigerian. And I don't fault you for that. And this thing also happens in India. It's called the caste system. That if you were born on the wrong sides of the track, you can never emerge from that dimension. That if you were born without, you can never come to a place where you are now with. But the devil is a liar. A caste system is a box. It is a limitation that is most and generally imposed upon you by systems created by men. But you are not subject to systems. Systems are subject to you if you believe that you carry the power of God in your life. That means they may create a limitation for you. Even those who think they are entitled, we will be surprised when you rise to become all God that what all God wants you to become. Do you not know that when God said you will emerge, he means it. The word emerge in the Latin is the word emigere. And emigere means that there are two movements. It means to dip something into something else, to submerge something into something else. That means that there are two movements in what you call emergence. The first movement is to put you by submersion into something where you are no longer visible, only what has submerged you is visible. But emerge is not submerge. Emerge means two movements. The first movement is submerge and the third, second movement is arise. That means that if you are going to emerge, you will go through something. Joseph, you may have to go to the pit. David, you may have to go to the backwoods. Uh, Daniel, you may have to go into the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro, you may have to go into the fiery furnace of Nebuchadnezzar. But to emerge means that even though you go in, there's nothing the devil can do about it. Baby, you are coming out. Now, if you don't believe you're coming out, you can choose to be an unbeliever if you like. But will all the believers look for two or three persons and tell them, I am coming out. I'm coming out. I'm coming out of 4,000 members. I'm coming out of lack. I'm coming out of insufficiency. I'm coming out of a land of not enough. I'm coming out of always less than I need to be. I refuse to be kept under somebody's labels and in somebody else's boxes. Slap another neighbor I have, I've tell her or tell him, don't let anybody put you in a box. Don't let them put you in a box. Don't let them tell you you cannot be or you will not become or you cannot have or you cannot go any further or it will not happen for you. The devil is a liar. They may look at your antithesis and say, your daddy was nothing, your mommy was nothing, your uncle was nothing, you didn't go to the right schools, but the devil is a liar. You may not have the money factor, you may not have the connection factor, you may not have the parent factor, you may not know the G.O. or the president, but my friend, do you not know you already have the God factor? And if God before you, who can be against you? If God is on your side, who is against you? When you have the God factor at any moment, it means God is about to step into your boat. He's about to sit down upon the vehicle of your destiny and take you where nobody else could ever take you before. Can I announce the Dominion Chapel and all the individuals who make up this great house? The God factor is about to multiply your possibility by infinity. 
they had already written me off and said my life was never going to work, that I'd never become. I was the least likely to succeed, but they didn't count in and factor the God aspect. Oh, you're not helping me. You see, you may not have anything going for you, but David, if God is on your side, you're next in line. You may not have anything going for you, Joseph, because they put you in a pit, but honey, even if they put you in the pit, your pit might be your transportation to the palace. First thing I want to tell you is forget about your antecedents. There's a God factor. The first thing you've got to recognize is forget the circumstances of your past. Don't allow them to be the forecast of your future. In other, in other words, when you want to look at where you can go and who you're going to be, don't look at your past. That also means some of the people from your past. Because the first people who will limit you are people who knew who you were. One of the greatest battles I've had is people who just refuse to accept that I'm a dynamic progressive. That if you define me today, the 24th of September, and you see me on the 25th of September, don't expect to meet the same person. Because I'm a work in progress. That means if you find my address on the 24th of September and you come back next year, I ain't going to be the same Negro new you knew. My life would have changed. My world would have transformed. My transportation would have changed. Uh, my vehicles for moving would have changed. Everything about me would be different. So if you try to define me based on who you knew me to be, you've made a mistake. If you want to know who I am like, look at my master. His name is El Shaddai. His name is Adonai. His name is El Elyon, Elohim. He's the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He's the unstoppable stone. You ain't helping me. I wonder if there are any possibility thinkers in the house who will take the limits of God and say to God, no more limits, say it. No more limits, say it. No more limits. When they tell you why are you thinking so big, they tell you it's a sin for you to not think more highly than yourself as you are. You know what you need to tell them when they tell you that? When they tell you, you, you don't want to think like that, tell them, God chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. You see, they don't mind Bill Gates thinking like that. They don't mind Warren Buffett thinking like that. They don't mind Carlos Halu Slim thinking like that. But when you and I think like that, they get upset. But do you know where Carlos Halu Slim started from? Do you not know that Bill Gates was a dropout from university? Do you not know that of the 10 top billionaires in the world, half of them were dropouts. They were considered failures. Oh God, I feel something happening. You know why? Because God doesn't necessarily choose Christians to confound the wise. He chooses the foolish things. The folk that look like it makes no sense for them to be the head and not the tail. If that's you, shout, I'm a candidate. There are people who can preach much better than I do, who have much more propriety than I have, who much more fit the bill for what a godly man ought to be than I do. But look at who God is using. Why? Because God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wisdom of the white. He has put this treasure, what treasure? In earthen vessels that the excellency of the power might be of God and not of man. If you are so perfect, they'll think you did it by yourself. But when you are not so perfect, not so likely to succeed, not the best kid on the block, and God chooses you, he doesn't choose the qualified, he qualifies the chosen. And that qualification, he did it on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago for whosoever believeth. You hear what I'm saying? Can I go a little further? So the first thing I want you to know is forget about the antecedents of your past. Because if you follow the past, it may suggest you a trajectory that is one of failure, demise, uh, uh, defeat. Uh, uh, it may suggest you a trajectory that does not behold a promised land that flows with milk and honey. It's the first thing I want you to get. The second thing I want you to get, I told you to forget my first point. My second point is remember. Forget the bad about your past, but remember the interventions of God in your history. 
I'm not talking about how he bought you a nice Mercedes Benz last week. I'm talking about when you were broke, no soap, no hope, kind of broke, and your sardine tasted better than Papado's. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? I remember when I married my girlfriend 22 years ago. Arm rubbers went to the house we were getting ready to move into, so we decided not to move. It was redirection. It wasn't rejection. And we lived in my mother's house for one and a half years with our newborn baby girl, his older sister. And we eventually moved to our own place because God moved us, gave us a great breakthrough in the Victoria Garden City. And when we moved there, we didn't have a cooker. We didn't have a stove. All we had was an iron and a couple of pieces of furniture and a mattress. Yeah, I didn't look like this. <laughs> and I had to boil our hot water and our eggs on the back of an iron. Paul Adifarasi. You know what I'm saying? A neighbor came and visited us, and he was in shock. He said, I can't let my pastor be like this. He said, I I'm going, this is a, a former drug addict. He said, I'm going to go and get you a stove. He drove up to Festac, came back with a two-rink kerosene stove. And that was a breakthrough for us. Just thinking about it, I feel goosebumps all over the back of my neck. And my, my pretty assorted Ajibata wife, <laughs> she learned to cook my rice and stew with dudu on a kerosene stove. The spice of life is not in the salt and pepper. It's in the interventions of God in your history that indicate to you that God's hand has been on your life from before you begun. And that his hand was not arbitrarily there. It was there because his hand is an indicator of promise that is imminent somewhere in the process of your future. Are you here? And my wife would make the finest dodo and stew and rice, but it would taste like kerosene. And we enjoyed it. In fact, I'm still looking for the taste of kerosene in my rice and stew. That's not all. We couldn't afford pampers. The only pampers we had were the ones that were given to us by close relatives who saw my wife washing nappies. His nappies, his older sister's nappies. Washing nappies. We only used pampers when we, it was Sunday best. Or we had to go out where people would, would see that we, we had nappies and not pampers. We had to use pampers. You hear what I'm saying? I remember how we couldn't pay the bill for the Muson Center. But God supernaturally broke through and paid for it. When you look back at the history of your life, you will see divine interventions where God stepped in to give you victory. That when you look back today, you would consider them small victories, but they were very big victories to you back then. This is what happened to David. When David was in the thicket with the woods and the lamb, a lion came out of the thicket and lunged for one of the lambs of his father's flock. And the anointing that David had perfected in practice, shooting at Coca-Cola cans with his catapult, he said, I can deal with this. And whilst he was momentarily afraid, the spirit of courage came upon him and he took down the lion the way he took down the Coke can. And the lion was beat. He delivered the lamb from the lion's mouth and after he did it, I believe he said, I can do this. The next time, God sent him another irrational creature. And this time, it was bigger than a lion. It was a bear. He did to the bear what he had done to the lion. God was perfecting his gift in the process of his practice. Are you listening to me, somebody? He was perfecting his gift in the process of his practice. And that's why you must appreciate this one factor. That your problem is an opportunity for God to show you that he is intricately involved in your life. And as he has been bringing you out through the litany of your past events and your past circumstances, he's not about to change. Hebrews 13 and verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. If he brought you out yesterday, he'll bring you out today and he'll still bring you out tomorrow though you may go through the flood it will not drown you though you go through the fire it will not burn you though you go into seven troubles he will still deliver you because if God before you there is no 
nobody who can successfully be against you. Everything they do against you, by the time God is done with it, it will turn and work in your favor. I have an old Jamaican mother, and when this mama goes to the kitchen to cook, she throws down big time. She'll beat any southern mama's cooking in this room. That Jamaican girl who's 92, homegirl can throw down. Can I get a witness from somebody? I'm thinking about her food right now. Don't let my wife get jealous. But when she starts to make that uh, effort rero, she, she, she'll take her ingredients and set them aside. The effort, the palm oil, the ej, eja, yo-yo, eja, we-we, eja, shower, ati eja, or so. The palm oil, the salt, the crawfish, or crawfish, the atarere, the tomatoes, and the tomato paste. Nobody takes the individual ingredients and eats them. You never see anybody drinking the palm oil, or just eating salt, or eating raw crawfish, or eating raw leaves that haven't been chopped and spiced. You hear me what I'm saying? But you let my mother mix it together and put it on some fire. After about 30 minutes, the savor of the aroma will waft through the air. And all the inhabitants of the house will know that something is cooking. And that you better get ready because something is about to happen. You know why? Because we know that all the ingredients work together for the good of them who love God and are the called according to his purpose. I know you've had some hard times and some tough seasons, but you allow God some time. With time, the cook of heaven, the chef of glory, will work everything together that your life will come out finger licking good. You're going to be tasty. Oh, you ain't here helping me what I'm saying to you this morning. If you believe about it, somebody shout it's good. You got the job, it's good. They fired you from the job, it's still good. He said he'd marry you, good. But before the wedding day, he jilted you for another lover, it's still good. You got the interview and they said yes. But before you could take on the assignment, they canceled the interview, but it's still good. You hear what I'm saying? You made a lot of money last year, good. But this year, you ain't making as much as you were making, it's still good. You got a doctor's report that said you got a perfect bill of health, good but next year or last year you got another report that said there are a few problems here look at somebody tell them it's still good you did a memory test five years ago no cancer good but last year you did another one they said there's a little lump there shout at somebody tell them it's still good you know why in God's hands if you let him work on it for a little while he's going to make everything work together for your good that means the good, the bad, and the ugly are going to work together for your good. The third thing you have to know. Number one, don't remember your past. Number two, remember the interventions of God in your past. Remember that. That's how David conquered Goliath. He remembered that if God could deliver me from two irrational creatures, even though this creature is bigger, but he's rational, God will surely deliver me and my nation from him. Yeah. Third thing, your gift is taking you somewhere. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, a man's gift will make space for him and bring him before great men. My third point is God gave you something to take you to the land flowing with milk and honey. Good Lord, I feel something. See, God will never give you a dream unless he gives you transportation to get to the fulfillment of that dream. You know, a dream is just a dream until you put a deadline on it. Then it becomes a goal. There are too many dreamers in the body of Christ. We need goal scorers. People who will take the dream and say it will be fulfilled 18 months from now. Who will put a deadline on the project and make the dream become a target by a certain time. Once you make the dream a goal, you are more likely to accomplish it. 
The next question then is, what do I have that's going to take me there? Do you not know that your gift is your Rolls Royce? Your gift is your transportation to take you from where you are in life to where God has promised to take you. He will not leave you without transportation. That gift is going to open up space for you and bring you before great men. Let me help you. I, I went to Ghana recently. And I haven't been to Ghana for eight years. I used to go there frequently, but I went a few weeks ago. Just as I was getting ready to go, one of my sons called me and said, Pastor, I'm sending you my 605, which is a nice bird, 13-seater, brand new. I said, oh, that's nice. Do it quickly. <laughs> and I went to the airport, drove up, and went straight into the aircraft. Uh, Customs and Immigration came, snapped my passport, and we flew. 45 minutes, we landed in Accra. We landed in Accra, and two black brand new SUVs drive up to pick me up, and a small black car in front of it. We jump, came out of the car, out of the aircraft, and a major comes and throws a salute. He says, "Good morning, Pastor. Um, I'm here to take your passports. Please let me have your passports." So myself and the two travel associates with me gave him the passports. We got inside the cars and we drove straight out of the airport. As we got to the airport gate, two presidential Escort riders now led us through Accra and were with us for the whole week that we were there. It was brilliant. <laughs> the gift of the president or the presidency to us was escort riders with sirens so that the heavy traffic of Accra would not impede my movement through the city in their transportation. See, a man's gift will make space for him and bring him before great men. And you could tell that as we passed by, everybody was looking, who's that? Wondering who's that? One Niger boy. One, one useless Niger boy. You hear what I'm saying? Who's that? Who's that? And places where we did stop in the seven days, five days we were there, and they wait for, to see who's going to come out of the car. Because often your transportation is greater than your person. Your gift indicates who you are going to be. And if you don't understand it like that, you may underestimate your gift. And as a result, underestimate yourself. The world does not move over and create space for people who haven't developed their gift. The world only moves over for people who have spent time knowing that they have a gift and working that gift in the privacy of obscurity. Because you don't have an opportunity to practice your gift when you become great. You have to practice it when you don't have an audience. David mastered his gift when he didn't have people to clap for him. His only congregation were a bunch of sheep. And the only thing they could say uh, when they tried to say well done was meh. But David recognized that what I'm practicing today, because if I'm faithful in that which is little, God will make me ruler over much. If I can look after my daddy's sheep well, he'll give me his sheep to look after. If I can look after that well, he might give me his nation. You hear what I'm saying to you? I want to tell you that God did not leave you without a gift. And your gift will announce itself to you when you have problems. Your problem becomes God's opportunity for you to discover your gift. Can I work it for a moment? Can I really work it for a moment? The way you're looking, you hungry. You hungry for this word. See, don't despise your problem and certainly don't run away from it. Who sent the bear and the lion against David? Was it God? No. It was the devil. But because David was in the kingdom of God, God allowed it because God knew that what David was carrying as gift for his purpose was more than equal to the lion and the bear. God never lets a problem come against you that your gift can't handle. Your gift couldn't handle it. He has to block the problem. He only allows into your challenge that which threatens you but doesn't threaten your gift. So that you recognize, if I don't deal with this, I might die. So you have to dig deep. And that's when you find the prowess of your gift. You hear what I'm saying to you? That's why he gave you the lion and the bear. 
Because he already could see the giant around the corner that you couldn't see. And he knows that a, a giant is a lesser contender than both the bear and the lion. The lion and the bear are not rational. The giant is rational. Something that doesn't have a mind, that thinks anyhow, I don't want to fight that. I want to fight somebody who can think a little bit. So if I, if I can beat him in my mind, then I'll beat him in the battle. You, you hear me? Your gift is taking you somewhere. And, and you have a set of gifts. I'm trying to finish. I got to get out of here. You have a set of gifts. At different seasons in your life, one gift may become primary. And then in another season, another gift becomes primary. Collaborating all the others. And then in another season, a third gift becomes primary. My first gift was just the grace to pray. I prayed, I prayed. I said, God, give me a tongue and utterance that cannot be gainsaid or resisted. I prayed, give, give me the ability to preach like Paul of Tarsus. I prayed, give me revelation. Give me wisdom. That was all I prayed. You know what I'm saying? After a while, the ability to speak vertically didn't subside, but it played second fiddle to the ability to speak horizontally. And I would shake in the pulpit for the first five minutes because I was nervous in front of seven people. But within a few moments, courage would come. And I'd find myself speaking with confidence, with boldness, knowing that God was standing up with me. You hear what I'm saying to you? And before I knew it, the gift started to open up space. Put me in presidential houses. Put me in front of great men. Loose their loins in front of me so that whatever I needed from them, they would gladly give without me soliciting. Can I get a witness from somebody? I dare you to find your gift. Your gift will be those escort riders to pick you up at the airport and open up your city to you, open up your career path to you, open up your destiny for you. Glory to God. You get it? If you don't believe it, say nothing. But if you do, tell somebody, my gift is taking me somewhere. If you're waiting for somebody to come and help you, you're mistaken. Your gift is going to take you where you deserve to go. Where you never thought was possible. But we often get it back to front. And this is how we get it back to front. We try to make space for our gift instead of allowing our gift to make space for us. They send me CDs. Pastor, I want to be at the experience. And I'll get 10, 20, sometimes 30 on a Sunday morning. And they're trying to make space for their gift. If you have to show me that you're gifted, I know you're not ready. If you are gifted, I will hear about you. Your gift will, will put you on the mouth of people who are credible witnesses to your prowess. Ha hallelujah. When David started talking at the battlefront, all the generals of Israel were cowering in their trenches. They were more of an intimidating factor than the giant himself. Because the fact that the big boys of the military were scared of the giant made the giant look stronger than he actually was. But David kept on talking. David's gift was courage and the gift of the gab. Homeboy knew how to talk. That before a few hours had passed, the message that there's a guy who can talk, he's only a little boy, fluttered into the king's palace and the king sent for the talker. David could articulate himself. The king said, yeah, come in, come in, come in. His gift brought him there. Small boy, 16 years old, but there was a look like a man from another planet in his eyes. When the king saw him, he said, you are but a youth. And that guy has been a warrior from here. He said, don't worry yourself, king. No shaking. Don't be afraid. Remember that God's definition of David when he said, I have rejected Saul, but I have found for myself in the house of Jesse a man after my heart at 16. God saw the tree inside the seed. Do you not know that as there's always a tree inside the seed, greatness has always been inside of you. But the challenge is, are you willing to bring it out? You know how you'll get it out? Practice your gift. All David had was five stones and a slingshot. 
and the ability to talk and sing. Singing brought God into his life. And then talking brought him into favor with the king. When the king heard him, he said, there's something about this boy. Don't want him to kill himself. He put his armor on him. The boy looked at it. He said, I'd rather wear God's armor. Keep your own. God's armor got me through all my trials. And God's armor will bring me through this one. He said, let me go at him, king. And he rehearsed the history of God's interventions. And said, king, don't even worry about it. I'm going to get ahead in life. That's how you get ahead in life. You cut off the head of the giant with his own sword. And you bring it back into town. Just in case they say it wasn't you that did it. And he walked into Saul's palace the second time. And is holding Goliath's head. The guy that taunted Israel for 40 days. That was David's gift. He was a giant killer. What other men were afraid of. David dared the grace of God. Let me pause there and then I'm going to wind it up. If you see God's grace on your life, in your history, are you with me? Are you with me? I dare you to dare the grace. Only God's grace could have brought you this far. Don't rest in the grace. Work the grace. Tell God, if you could do this with the lion and the bear, I believe you can build 5,000. I believe when we build it, you can fill it. I did that. You can do it too. Do I have two heads? I work in Nigeria. You in Houston, friend. <laughs> the land of promise that flows with milk and honey and butter too. If you ain't careful to add some yogurt and some cheese. <laughs> you hear me? That, that's, that's the third thing. You've got to know that the gift is taking you somewhere. The fourth thing, and I'm going to end on this one. I have five, but I'm only going to give you four. Number four, you have to believe God. That God wants you to win, wants you on top, wants you ahead in life, wants you to be the head only and never the tail. You've got to believe that God wants it more than you want it. And he has already provided everything you need in order for you to be on top. He's not going to provide it. He has already provided it. Can I shock you? God hasn't healed anybody since Calvary. God hasn't blessed anybody since the cross. When he was stretched wide and hung high, he breathed his last and said, tell telestai in the Greek, meaning it is finished. That means whew, in six days, in six days, God created the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. He sat down. God is not working. He's sitting. The father is sitting. Then he said, all right, man has fallen. Who shall go for us? Whom shall we send? The son said, here am I. Send me. And the son went and finished the work. The work was not healing or miracles or deliverance. Those were attestations of his divinity. His real work was to go to the cross and pay the full weight of the price for your redemption and for the cost of your sin. When he had finished that, he came and he said, Father, mission accomplished. The father said to him, sit down. And the son sat down and rested from all his work. It's now the time for the Holy Spirit to go. And the Holy Spirit now came, went inside the believer, and he is still working to regenerate us. Whilst we are already seated by the father, we are not perfect, though we are perfect. You get it? You understand what I'm saying? So that is a finished work. What does he mean by finished work? You are already prosperous. But you might not walk in it if you don't know it. You are already completely healed and whole. But you might not walk in it unless you know it. Because you already have it. God is not going to heal you. Because he has already healed you. 
God is not going to bless you because he has already blessed you. Can I prove it? Ephesians 1 verse 3. Can you put that on the screen? I know I didn't give it to you. Ephesians 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you understand tenses better than I do. Who has blessed us, that's past tense, with some spiritual blessings. With every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So you're already blessed. But that blessing is first spiritual. That means the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which do appear were not made by the things which do appear. So the invisible or the spiritual creates the visible. So God gives you things like favor, wisdom, grace, understanding, wisdom, uh, revelation, knowledge. And that's what produces in the natural all the materiality of the spiritual blessings you already have. So God does not give out money. He gives out value and favor. And wisdom. You get it? You get it? Okay. Let me help you to get that right. The Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. That means if you don't have social graces, that's a grace from God. It's a gift from God. No wonder you have an empty bosom. Because God doesn't give money. He gives favor. Now, if I have favor and I am a giver, my favor with men makes men instruments for God to get material things to me. So if you have no network, don't expect any income. You can give all you like, but if, if in your giving, you also don't create networks and friendships, nothing's going to come back to you because mankind are the vehicle through which he gets it to you. But what God gives you is not money. He gives you value like favor, faith, grace. You, you appreciate? So shout at two people. Tell them, I'm already blessed. Shout at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, watch out for me because I'm already blessed. And what God put in, I'm about to work it out. Shout hallelujah, somebody. Back in Lagos in 1983, 1993, and I was trying to get my papers to go back to my parish in London where I was the pastor of the London Parish of Action Chapel. And God showed me that I would not go back. And the proof of it was the British High Commission uh, deferred my application for my religious papers. And as I prayed more and more and more, God showed me that I've given you a mighty church in the city of Lagos. And I asked him, where is the church? I thought he was going to point to a church or a parish somewhere that would hire me as the pastor. But instead of telling me anything like that, he put his hand on my heart and told me, the church is inside of you. The moment he did that, I knew that I would birth outwardly what he had put in me inwardly. And the moment I accepted it, I began to get visions of the house on the rock. He gave me detailed plans for the physicality of the work and the spirituality of the work and the theology of the work. And as I meditated on it the more, he gave me all the plans for the outworking of the internal. I don't know who I'm talking to, but somebody under the sound of my voice, uh, there's a skyscraper in Dallas that has not been built and it's on the inside of you. There's a business that will cover America and become one of the Forbes 500 that's inside of somebody under the inside of this room. There's a marriage that has evaded somebody for the last 38 years, but within the next 12 months it will become your reality. Who am I preaching to this Sunday morning? I want you to shout out your neighbor and tell them, believe God. Believe, God. believe that with God all things are possible. That's the fourth thing I want you to know. And before I close, I'm only going to tell you what the fifth thing is. Number one, forget about your past. Number two, remember God's divine interventions in your life. And number three, uh, know that your gift is going to make space for you and bring you before great opportunities and before great men. Number four, believe God. Don't believe the news or the newspaper or your naysayers or your haters or even some of your friends. But whatever you do, do not disbelieve God. Believe that with God all things are possible. This is hugely important. And number five, believe in yourself. 
You have to believe that you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works. That you are fearfully and wonderfully made in his likeness and in his image. That you are the zenith of his creation. You are the apple of his eye. You are his perfect resemblance. That when God wanted to look in the mirror, he made you. And every time he wants to see his power, see his glory, see his wisdom, he looks at you. You are his mirror and he is your mirror. That's why you must know Christ. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18 says, The Lord is that spirit. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And we all beholding with open face as in a mirror. We behold the glory of the Lord and are transformed into the same image. That means as he is, so are we in this world. If Jesus could do it, so can you. That's why we're trying to give you Christ's mind. So that you don't just take instructions, you think the way Christ thinks. You think it not robbery to be on the same level as God. But you carry it with humility. Who humbled himself. Hallelujah. You have to believe in you. Paul believed in himself. But the predicator to that is he believed in, in God first. He believed in Christ first. He said, I can do. It sounds arrogant until you hear the rest of the verse. Through Christ who strengthens me. When they showed me the bill for the Rock Cathedral, it was billions and billions and billions and billions. At first I said, we can't do this. Then I heard another voice inside me said, you can't do anything. You can't do anything. When we looked at the bill for the experience, and we were getting ready to start it, the, the naysaying voices in my head and from haters, it was so overwhelming. But if I didn't believe in myself, I would have drowned in what they said. In fact, you cannot go on to be great if you don't believe in you. In fact, you can't go on to be great if you don't believe in you too. Believe in God, but also believe in yourself. Believe in who God has made you to be. Beloved, it does not yet appear what we be. But when we see him as he is, and you don't have to wait till the rapture for that to happen. When we see him as he is, we be, we is like him. That's your reality. And I don't like to leave my house until I dress my mind up in that consciousness. That that's who I am. My wife might not be able to see it yet. But as long as I see it now, she will sooner or later see it too. And once two of us agree, nothing can stop it. I choose my friends based on what they believe. People who I share my heart with and where I believe God has taken me, I don't share that with everybody. I share it with people who believe like I do and who have similar aspirations, similar convictions based on the teaching of Jesus Christ. They understand the unsearchable riches of of Christ that every time God blesses or has blessed it's always in accordance with the riches and the glory of Christ are you here yes, friends you are going somewhere yeah. I don't know about you but I've taken all the limits of God when I look at great ministries like the redeemed Christian Church of God I'm not going to replicate RCCG but God did that for pastor E. A. Adeboye he will do mine for me he will do whatever yours is for you don't limit God all that pastor Adeboye is of the many things that he is is an advertorial to you that if God could take a young man who had no slippers who came from nowhere who had no antecedents that suggested that he would ever become anything and is perhaps the most prominent and powerful man of God upon the face of the earth. Friends, whatever God has in store for you, whatever he was hoping for when he called you, he can do that too. I looked closely at Pastor Adeboye. I, I walked around him. We meet at least six, seven, eight times a year in various senior leadership meetings and I checked to see if there are two heads on his shoulders. <laughs> I check to see if there's something different about his anatomy that makes him more special than you or me. And every time I looked, I could find no evidence for a special superiority. In fact, when I looked and listened at him, I found that perhaps you and I might have more opportunity. You don't hear me what I'm saying. God's getting ready to do something with you. We remove all the limits. 
of wrong belief systems or ideologies or mindsets or castes or boxes or labels that men have put on you to say that you will come this far but no further. And I declare over your life this Sunday morning that all the limits have been shattered. Your brass ceilings are broken. Your glass ceilings have been torn down. Where they said you could not go, you will go much further. You will establish new limits. You will establish new dimensions. What they said was impossible becomes possible in your life. Can I get a witness from somebody?